Take me to a river I want to go Oh, go oh, oh. Take me to a river I want to know Tip me in your smooth waters I'm going Is a man with many crimes Come up for air As my sins flow down the Jordan Ooh, I want to come here and give you Every part of me but there's blood on my hands and my lips aren't clean take me to your river i want to go the way democracy should work and the way government should work in general should work in a way that prioritizes people who are the most at risk in society. Uh, and what I mean by at risk is like people who are less likely to make it to those core ideals of freedom, justice, equality. I feel like people who are incarcerated are, if not the most at risk, the communities they come from definitely are. In Illinois, black community members make up about 14% of our state's population. However, over half of our prison population consists of black people. And so not only is our prison population disproportionately black, but that disparity is worse in Illinois than the average in the rest of the country. And that's totally unacceptable for us to continue incarcerating people disproportionately based on race and then disenfranchising people disproportionately based on race. Given the reality that we live in a country that incarcerates more people than any place in the world, um, it's important that we just take a step back and like look at that number and ask ourselves if that's something that we're okay with, something that we feel a society should be. And we really should take a step back and look at whether or not this is a system that works, and I don't think it does. I don't think that we, on the outside of prison walls, have the knowledge or lived experience necessary to reform these systems in such a way that they are not so harmful to our communities. And so I think the only way that we can do that is by ensuring that people who are in these institutions are given a solidified voice in the political process. Community members in jail and prison, I've seen have the most astute insights into our policy system, into our government system. They are affected by government decision makers every single day in big ways and in small ways. And law and policy professionals like me, we don't have a chance of actually solving any problems, actually solving any racial injustices if we don't get input from people most directly affected. And we can try to draft laws or file litigation, and that's only going to be one piece of the puzzle that ultimately is not gonna work if we don't have a glimpse into how the system actually works and what people actually need who are facing disenfranchisement. You have any level of privilege, which, uh, you know, naturally comes in this country when you're not black, then you have an opportunity to step away from this issue and look at it if you decide to take an interest. But for many of us, this isn't something that we choose to take an interest in. If we want our society to be better, if we want our families to be safe, if we want our communities to survive, then we have to like dismantle these systems. 
but to get there it takes a lot of intentionality it takes a lot of thinking and it takes a lot of questioning of the reality that we live in uh, for the privileged and for those who are not so privileged. How can we say that we want to advance racial equity? How can we say we're here protecting voting rights if we're not trying to address the basic issue of disenfranchisement for community members in jail and prison? I believe that 50 to 100 years from now, people are going to look back on this era of mass incarceration and it's going to be mentioned in the same breath as slavery and Jim Crow. But it's hard to see it because America moves in a malicious way. And it gets back to that facade that like, America's a perfect country, America's great. It's just these bad actors that we need to just punish, get out of the way so we can get back to being this beautiful, patriotic, wonderful place. That's just not the truth. This country was founded on bloodshed and harm that still waters the soil of this land. Um, and until this country is prepared to like look that in the face, and figure out how do we bring these citizens who built this land up to a space that is equal, then punishment is going to be the solution because punishment negates people from having to take accountability for the society that's been created by those who are in power, which are typically not black, not brown, not poor, it's just white. There's this narrative that goes on in our politics. There's this narrative that goes on in our media that these institutions keep our communities safe. Police keep our communities safe. Prisons keep our communities safe. Jails keep our communities safe. There's this idea that these institutions are removing people who are a threat to society so that our society can function in peace. But it's just not the truth. It's just a narrative that has been the narrative for a very long time and people are just used to it being this way. And they can't see beneath the facade of the narrative to the reality of the situation. We know well that the reasons for disenfranchising incarcerated community members were racist in origin and that racism is perpetuated by anyone who wants to keep that system going now, whether they intend to have a racist effect or not, that's exactly what we're doing when we disenfranchise a majority black population in Illinois, for example, and a disproportionately black and brown population all over the country. We recently had a voting in prison legislative hearing in Illinois, and there was not one sound reason given for disenfranchising community members and correctional institutions. 
from after the Civil War, when there were an increased number of black voters uh, who were formerly enslaved individuals, our state and national governments used various tactics to try to continue to limit the power of those individuals. There were some people back then in our country's history who argued for concepts like universal suffrage. Shouldn't everyone have the right to vote if they're a citizen? And it seemed like that should be a common sense principle in a country that claims to value freedom. But even back then, those political ideals were rejected by people who were threatened by the prospect of black people having power through tactics like poll taxes and literacy tests and legal and practical barriers for black community members gaining the right to vote, there was, continued to be suppression even long after slavery ended. And to this day, felony disenfranchisement laws are still a vestige of that. It's still socially acceptable and legally acceptable in most of the country to disenfranchise people who are convicted and who are serving a sentence and who are imprisoned, even though the vast majority of those individuals are citizens and are considered citizens in many senses of the word, but who are dehumanized when it comes to voting rights and, and being able to have a say in who represents them. There are many obstacles that can arise when you're trying to pass a bill or trying to amend legislation in the state of Illinois. Um, as many folks are aware, the state of Illinois is known for corruption, is known for machine politics, is known for utter racism and just the inallowance of impactful legislation to be passed. As many people are also aware or may not know, the state of Illinois and our current state legislature is in a place where it's never been before. Um, we have significant more black and brown leadership and significant more progressive black and brown leadership that we have ever seen in our state legislature. Um, so it allows for poten potential for more change. However, we as Chicago Votes, as young people, as black and brown young people, um, we will always see the obstacles because they will be targeted at us in many, uh, in most of the situations. And even though we've had a reckoning as a country and as a city in terms of racial justice and we claim that we value black voices and we claim that we are, we even hear from some government leaders in Illinois that we're post-racial and that racism is in our past or that racism is in the South and we have this figured out. The fact remains that our government leaders have found it acceptable to continue disenfranchising a primarily black population in our prison. And it's, it's through complacency that our system has gone on like this. It's not for a sound policy reason. It's not to deter crime those kinds of excuses are not legitimate and they're not factual. And we just have clung on to this old way of doing things without a sound reason for it. My name is King Musa. I'm an artist, formerly incarcerated. Um, what got me involved in this work was the fact that at the age of 14, I was incarcerated and tried as an adult um under felony murder law and uh my whole thing was just advocating for juvenile justice while i was in incarcerated and just um trying to bring awareness of the injustice that the justice system is and so in every way possible through my portrait drawings through rapping through spoken word i just wanted to bring awareness to the situation um i've been in situations where the judge has told an individual man if you don't cut your hair Next time I, by next time I see you, I will give you five more years onto your sentence. Um, things like that highlight the fact that there's a prejudice in these um, courtrooms. And then you gotta ask yourself, why did he say that, right? What, what was he trying to get across? Um, a lot of times, lawyers even hold this statement over people's heads, like they'll tell you like, if I was you, I'll just clean, clean up your, your image, uh, be clean cut next time you come. 
And so for me, what that's telling me and is that since I have dreads, I'm a thug in your eyes. Or I'm not, I'm not good enough. You know what I'm saying? My culture is degraded. It's, it's, it's being seen as something negative instead of me being me, <laughs> you know? And so uh, right then it shows me that you're looking at me in a, in, a, in, a, in a lens of prejudice. What this country was founded on didn't break down. It just transformed. It just evolved in these different, these different aspects. And so the right to vote is just one. Giving people in prison the right to vote, uh, we will be able to hopefully start to hold these judges more accountable to the decisions that they make. As it currently stands, the decisions that they make and the people that are most harmed by those decisions, there is no system of accountability there. Uh, so they make a decision, they ruin somebody's life, that person's gone forever, life goes on. And all you have to do is sit in these courtrooms and realize that the way the dialogue is happening in these institutions is not around like a human being and their experience that led them to standing in front of a judge. It is just numbers. It's a number system. It's a number game. Uh, and that's a direct result of how many people are incarcerated in America and in Illinois and uh, how these institutions have functioned for decades and hundreds of years to come. Unfortunately, we have very persistent racial inequities in Chicago and beyond. And when it's still unfortunately so racialized in terms of whether a person or a family has fair access to a good education, has fair access to housing and health care, there are some community members who from the beginning don't stand a fair chance of being able to really thrive. And until we change some of those basic conditions, then I think there's not too much that we can do to jump to conclusions about whether someone has done something wrong and what kind of over punishment they should get as a result. My name is Lauren Metlock. I am a community organizer for Rural Illinois, wife, mom. Um, both my brother and my husband are currently incarcerated serving de facto life sentences and um, they can't vote. Um, being a part of the black community, you're used to getting chased down. You're used to being roughed up. You're used to being snatched up. All of the things that are now coming to the forefront have been that way for years and years. Uh, my grandmother's house was raided. There was nothing found. There was um, no cause, it was no search warrant, there was no apology afterwards. The safety is never the same. You feel violated. I cannot make it all officers are bad because we have a lot of officers in our family. And so I had that perspective of, no, oh, they're gonna help. And then when you see the people that are supposed to help you violate you and do traumatic things, um, it changes you. It puts not just fear and doubt, but when there is a problem, when you do need help, you know that's not who you call. You have the right to hold these elected officials accountable because you pay their salary, just like we do. But we just get the uh, results of their power, of their authority, without being able to hold them accountable, without being able to say, I don't like this judge. You get to vote for uh, them, but we don't. Nobody will be able to help hold a judge accountable um, in a way that we will, or those directly affected will, because we can sense when someone is racist, we can sense when someone is uh, biased, prejudiced, um, just through their actions, through, through the fact that we're in a bullpen and we might not, we might know 10 individuals who just got sentenced to this guy and they all got 25 years at 100%. Um, these are certain things that the public won't even know or never hear about. And so um, I feel like if these individuals had a voice, then the public would know. Um, we would be able to, uh, you know, bring awareness to these type of judges. Uh, these type of prosecutors, these type of people who hold these key positions who are, defect, who are directly affecting our communities. From our criminal legal system to our prisons 
to even our voter registration system and other parts of our government bureaucracies that may seem kind of bland on their face. The reality is that they were structured to suppress black voices, to prevent black community members from gaining or maintaining power. Currently with one of our bills and prison slave labor, um, little technical issues like when you file a witness slip, a witness slip is a form that any community member can file on a bill to say if they are in support or they're against a bill, and it tells legislators how the community feels. Currently, for one of our bills, when you go and file a witness slip, there are two options for the same bill. That could be extremely confusing for community members that may have never filed a witness slip before. They are filing it for one of them, which auto-populates to our bill, and the other one doesn't. And so these are small things that could have easily just been a technical mistake, but when do technical mistakes happen on incredibly influential bills? It happens intentionally. I'm Ronaldo Hudson, and I was directly impacted by a crime that occurred 37 years ago. I was a 19-year-old drug addict, illiterate, and living in the slums of the city of Chicago. But I am the person responsible for my actions. I just didn't know how damaged I was. I spent seven years in the Cook County Jail, 13 years on Illinois' death row, and 17 years with life without the possibility of parole. And so I watched seven governors during my incarceration. You know, when people think about that, you know, it's amazing. So it was only when Governor Prisker in 2020 decided that he would commute my sentence, right? That I realized that, hey, I now have the right to be heard. Even though I'm a loud, like long-winded brother, like I knew that my voice wasn't as powerful because I could not determine who would be my representative in the state and even the federal uh, legislation. Like, I had no power because I had no vote. You had veterans who no longer have the right to vote, but yet gave their life to make sure everybody had the right to vote or to gain a life for this, to protect this country. And then they made a mistake in society and then now they don't even have a voice anymore. The 80% of women who are incarcerated right now are mothers who are being governed by elected officials that they don't even have the right to say, like, I don't like the way, you know, you're doing X, Y, and Z. But these are their kids, right? So they don't even have a voice to, to be a parent uh, fully, right? When I was granted release, I had a counselor that had to process me that was bitter over my release. And so he was very indifferent. Right? I'll never name him because I won't give him the credit. The policy doesn't allow us to be heard. And so people like that, they have things where they say, uh, the code of professional conduct, but nothing is done about those misconducts, that those type of people are not allowed in those positions. Because I think it's imperative that people have access to rehabilitation and re-entry information and not from someone that's simply mad over your release. Can you imagine that? I did 37 years and this person was mad that he had to give me the paperwork. I was like, you can be as mad as you want, man. And this is making this so much more wonderful because you're revealing who you really are. You don't believe in justice. You know, you believe in the slave mentality. I was your slave. And you thought you would retire with me walking around a prison, not having the right even to be heard. But any small thing um, that you can do to tick off a CO, they can write you up. They can put it, give you a ticket. We already know how the systems work um, if they want to get back at you. The, the policies that govern the visitation it comes from the top of corrections, from the director down. But what people don't know is that each prison is almost like an island unto itself. And so if you have the best person at the top, it doesn't necessarily address the issues. You know, so you have people that will 
harass visitors because they say, well, those pants are too tight. That shirt is not low enough. And someone may have driven two hours, four hours, eight hours to come and visit a loved one, but they tur they're turned around. And a single officer has too much discretion to make those type of decisions. I remember when the visiting um, was unlimited when I was in Dixon uh, Correctional Center. Uh, the visits was unlimited, unlimited, so you could come twice a week, I mean, on the weekends, whatever you, you chose. Now, through law change, they, um, they made it to where it was they made it to where it was seven, then it went down to six, and then it was only two weekend visits. So if you had um, your mom who, who worked through the week, and then you had your girlfriend who worked through the week, but also had a friend who worked through the week, they had to either split the visit, like to come together, or um, just was shit out of luck, for lack of a better word. So if they, um, if they came on that weekend, the first weekend of the other month, you won't be able to get no more visits for the rest of the, rest of the uh, month. I'm very careful about the things I say and do, especially when I'm visiting. If somebody doesn't take kind to anything, I know that there might be retaliation. I know that they can take away my visiting privileges on a whim, and they don't have to prove it, and there is no fight about it. Just knowing that they are there, and if they have a wisdom tooth that is infected, they can't go and find relief. They... It's a process to know that if they need any support service, mental health, um, anything, there is, it is not there for them. They cannot have that. They are viewed and treated like subhuman. They're not even treated like animals. Peter would have a fit. Some of the state representatives that refuse to recognize that there are inhumane conditions in prison and they would st stand up and say things like, well, they're prisoners, it's supposed to be hard. No, we're citizens who happen to be incarcerated and our punishment is the actual sentence, not mistreatment. And so there's so many people who are in the, the body of the elective process, but they don't care about the people that are infected. My granny passed not long after my brother was incarcerated. And one thing I remember was he kept a picture of her. And when you are shipped from one facility to another, you cannot have any personal belongings. They have to be packaged. You know, I understand safety and protocol. But when they found this picture, they, bre they beat my brother because the rules are the rules. And it is police brutality runs rampant even behind the prison walls. My employment in prison was slavery, to, to get right to the point. Uh, you get paid 18 cents an hour, um, $18 a month to do um, janitorial work, to, do, um, to be a cook in the kitchen, um, to, do, to do outside landscaping. Um, all of these different jobs that I partook, partook in um, is laborious jobs. For me, it's the degrading. Right, especially in, in situations where if I was working in the kitchen, I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I make breakfast the moment I come in. People have different diets, so I gotta prepare different meals for um, different individuals, different religions, different um, health problems. So um, all these different things, uh, all the while, the supervisor is just sitting on his ass, like watching me and telling me what to do. He get paid good to sit back and supervise me, do all of the work. So it's a degrading aspect of it. It's an oppressive, depressive aspect of it. It's a, um, a continuation of what we already feel, like the, the, the oppressive nature of prison is being exaggerated um, in, the work for, in the workplace inside these institutions. The state gives you, supposed to be like $10 um, a month, but it always comes down to eight seventy-five or nine ten. It's never the full, it's full 10 because if we was on lockdown a day, you don't receive that. As much lockdown you own, it cuts, it cuts down. So you never receive that full 10, right? Which is nothing. But let's say I work um, the whole month, I'll receive $18 on top of my $10 state pay at the end of the month. You have to pay for toothpaste. You have to pay for deodorant. You have to pay for paper. You have to pay for en uh, uh, envelopes. You gotta pay for everything, right? You gotta pay for all of these different things on top of paying for food. Because we get fed like pigs, we get fed like an animal. The food that they give you is 
I wouldn't consume it. And they lock away the seasons, the seasoners, and put all that stuff for staff rather than the people that they should be giving it to. In most cases, it's horrible. And so everyone in prison is usually keeps them ketchup, hot sauce, and mustard so that whatever they have, you can cover it up, right? A lot of times, um, even if they feed, feed you um, three times a day, it's an inadequate meal, right? Uh, matter of fact, they went back to two times a day. So in some institutions, they give you brunch and then they give you dinner, and that's it, right? So if you want to pay for food also, and you only go into the commissary twice a month, what can I do with $30 a month? I know individuals who have to choose between, damn, do I, do I brush my teeth or do I get some food, you know? And so these conditions breed a lawless environment, as you could imagine, because people got to eat. So now it's like, you got this shark on shark world where it's like, okay, I'm looking for the guy who has the money, who family is supporting him. And now it's like, yo, you wanna go to yard? Okay, go yard and have fun. Now I'm the individual who looking at you and looking at your cell, like I gotta get in the cell because he has food. It's literally like that, you know? It's literally like that and, it's, and, it's, and these are the conditions, these are the things. It's the same thing in, in, in society. Um, we know where um, poverty exists, crime flourishes. It's the same inside the institution. The state of Illinois makes plenty of money housing and farming all of these people and they cannot, they don't care about their staff, they don't care about their CEOs, they didn't have what they needed, they were complaining, they wanted help. But when they're able to leave and come back and let COVID grow and become a hot spot and people are losing their lives and there is no, there isn't a person to contact, you just hope and pray that you won't get a call that something has happened to your loved one. COVID has exasperated so many of the issues to constantly, for them to see so many people that never come back. And this was in the beginning, like what's going on, what's going on? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, let me just take a second. Y'all, cause it's crazy, like it's really crazy in there. I don't know if y'all have family, but people is in there dying, they are dying, they are dying. You know? The same way we cry and we mourn and we hurt when they lose somebody that they have spent years with in a, a, a six by six cell. They cry, they mourn, they hurt. There are so many issues that could be addressed if um, these people, these underserved people, were able to vote and voice their concerns. And they have a lot of solutions to issues. In the, in the midst of the problem is usually to the solution. I really believe that. And... Um, if they just had a voice, I think it would give them hope to do better, to know that somebody's listening, to know that they have a chance to correct some of the ills in the world, whether they were a part of them or not. It's two million plus people in prison. You, you're willing to say to people, I would rather benefit and draw all the life out of you and then discard you. Okay, go be free. You know the way that exists. I'm destined to return back to prison because I have no sense of society. That's why before I left prison, I was a citizen before I left prison. I didn't become a citizen when I walked out of prison. I, was, I began to walk around that prison as a citizen and I spoke to everyone with that authority from the wardens down. And they used to be like, you, you think too much of yourself? I said, no, I don't think enough of myself. I don't think too much of myself because I'm better than this. I'm bigger than this. And I knew who I was and I, sh and I practiced it so that my peers could see, hey man, we can be better than that. Look, let's check out Mr. Hudson. And he ain't bootlicking, right? He ain't compromising. But I wasn't playing with my peers as well. I wasn't playing with the administration, but I wasn't playing with my peers as well, right? So I believe in accountability and responsibility and you can't be accountable if you don't know your rights. At the end of your incarceration, they say to you, go be independent. So if I didn't get no training or no understanding of what that mean, 
That's why it's important to be educated and learning your constitutional rights and things that you have coming. But the prison is all predicated on just we'll tell you what to do. Wake up, go to sleep, go to yard, child time, go to commissary, go to work, shut up, watch TV, count time, count time, count time. And nothing really that engages the process of, wait a minute, I should be stimulated in a different way, right? I should be placed in an environment where everyone is respectful, and then I begin to know, oh, this is what I need to do in society, right? I can transition into a healthy relationship if I was in a healthy environment. But many people are coming out of prison worse than they were when they went in because there is no real engagement if it's not self-engagement. Yeah, and so bringing in and beginning to humanize people. Hey, you know you can speak up. You know you do have a constitutionally protected right to do the following. That is so powerful. I think we Americans are obsessed with solutions that seem easy or straightforward. Um, nothing about the correctional system and carceral system is cheap or convenient, but we have fooled ourselves into thinking that it can be an easy or feasible or practical solution to much deeper problems. And uh, when people are out of sight, when incarcerated community members are out of sight, are away from some of our communities, it may be easier to tune out their living conditions, the realities of what they face and the injustices that they face. People who don't think they're impacted, I always say, you're always impacted because your tax dollars is either in encouraging a good policy or encouraging a bad policy. So I say to people, if you care about your tax dollars, then you should want a, a good return. Like I can't imagine anyone saying, I have a thousand dollars that I'm going, to, I'm going to invest. And they spend in a billion dollars in corrections, right? But you don't want a return. That's not, that's insanity. So I think that people have to remember that you want the very best from your resources and you want, you should want your state representatives to actually push everyone to be the best person they could be. I'll tell you in my family, I don't think there was a lot of conversation about the conditions of incarceration until having to have some firsthand experience with that. And then the whole picture changes of what's just and um, you know when we should give someone the benefit of the doubt and when we should jump to a punishment solution. But until someone's gone through that life situation, I don't know that enough of us stop to think about what could be the repercussions of you know, criminalization or of just pointing the finger at someone who's accused of doing something wrong. Yeah, so, you know, it, you know, we all, everyone that believes that in America believe that people, citizens should be treated right and that all citizens should have life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Where it is, where it comes from that a person that's been convicted and that's locked up in jail should lose their right to vote and to participate in democracy, that's lost on me. You know, people that believe in criminal justice reform believe that one day people that's locked up in prison will come home. And we believe that when you go to prison, you go to pay your time and you go to be reformed. And when you cut a person off of democracy in the form of participating in voting, I think you cut off the one of the number one ways to help them reintegrate into society um, when they when they're released. There is one thing that I believe beside connecting with your family that can help you become a better citizen, participate in democracy and have a say in the way government treats people. And that is voting. 
And so when you take that away from people, you shut them out of democracy, you shut them out of the responsibility of a citizen, and you also um, hinder their, um, their um, ability to reintegrate in society and be corrected. And that's what jail is supposed to do. It's not supposed to make them worse. So if you spend 10 years in prison and you, you don't participate in democracy, you lose an interest and there's a certain responsibility that you lose as an individual. And I believe that, you know, working with you and your coalition, if we could pass a bill to allow citizens in this country the right to vote, it will change the way uh, citizens that's locked up in prison are recovering and re-entering society. I think when people are put in the worst positions and they have choices to make, sometimes they're not the right choices. Um, I think punishment is necessary. However, it should be appropriate to the crime. Um, and I don't trust the system to punish anybody because of over sentencing, because of um, the school to prison pipeline, because of mass incarceration, be all of these things, all of the studies, all of the reports, all of the statistics, we know that. And yet we still have this system that uh, disenfranchises people, that locks people up and throws away the key, that um, rips families apart. The, one of the adversarial parts of our judicial system is that you immediately, when you are arrested, you immediately are put in an adversarial position. Hey, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have a right to attorney. So you immediately start to clamp up. And then it's in your best interest to shut up because anything you say really will be used against you. However, what that does also is it creates a hurt and a, a barrier to people that just might want to know, hey, would you please say you sorry? Would you please acknowledge the fact that this hurt me and my family? But no one during my incarceration of the, over 37 years, no one ever stopped and said to me, hey, what happened? How did you get here? I attempted to self-medicate. That's why I turned to drugs. That's why I turned to PCP, because I wanted to live in a fantasy world. I didn't want to live in the hurtful world of being rejected and being feared. There's this misperception that those people who are incarcerated or who have been incarcerated are politically apathetic. They don't really care because they don't vote. That is so not true. Um, what I'm learning both from my incarcerated students and more reading is many of them don't vote because they can't. And so some of the scholars who are writing about this don't get to that question. They don't ask why. And so they come up with these conclusions about lack of participation, but never really got to that question of why even asking, do you live in a state where you're just permanently disenfranchised? Um, and so working with people um, on the inside where some of my students actually put together their own in-house survey, it was small, there's no way you can call it scientific, you can't do a scientific survey in a prison, um, but they wrote this wonderful survey and the results that they got made it very clear that um, people at Stateville are very politically aware and astute and interested and engaged, even though they can't vote. Um, and you don't have to take our word for it on that survey. Um, there was a, a much larger survey done in California that yielded very, very similar results, high interest in voting, whether if, if they could while incarcerated, definitely when they're out, high interest in connections of being able to say, look, that they have a stake in their community when they get out. Um, often though, low knowledge about one's voter eligibility and how to regain that eligibility. So I think that's there's two pieces when we're educating folks about this. We, we need to educate folks that they do have a right to vote when they get out. That message needs to be broadcast because I would have conversations with people, again, with PhDs in political science, who thought like many people that a felony conviction meant permanent disenfranchisement across the, the country, and that's not true. One of the greatest weapons during slavery was to keep them ignorant. Don't let them learn to read. How dare you talk about the right to vote? You don't even know what to do with your rights. You know, we don't want you to read. So when they say why they cut off educational programs, because ignorant, illiterate people, 
right? Can't make really rational decisions. That's why we want to get everyone as educated as possible. That state's attorney in that county, like only won, won last year by 800 votes. And it's 1,200 people in some of the prisons, right? And so it's important, I think it's imperative that people begin to understand that every time you disfranchise a person that is directly incarcerated person, you really affecting the whole state. Before I left, I started a program called The Building Block where we began to educate ourselves, where we took the educational procedures from staff and turned the day rooms that they were used to us acting out and playing cards into classrooms. And that's the type of stuff when people are more informed, right, are able to make better decisions, which we will become voting blocks and not just individual votes, right? Because voting blocks can affect the whole state. To be politically engaged is actually to be aware. So when you're not, you don't, you don't feel like you're a part of what's actually going on. You don't feel like you're, um, that we're one as a society because I don't have a voice. And so you start to become bitter towards everything that represents um, that. Anybody in that political field is kind of like a turnoff just because you, can, you're not, you don't even want to be inclined or uh, be engaged with what's going on because you don't have a vote. It's almost useless. And so I feel like um, if we had that opportunity, we'd be more engaged, we'd be more uh, community involved. And I feel like it's, you know, it's, it's vital that we start to see that. It'd be a part of rehabilitation when it comes to re uh, re-entering into society, for sure. And it will give them a sense of pride. I'm doing something good for my community. I'm doing my part. I'm pulling my weight. I'm having a say-so in fixing and changing the world we live in. rights of all people, including pretrial detainees, who have yet to be convicted of a crime and therefore retain the right to vote, he will sign this bill as is. If Governor Rauner is committed to valuing the lives and the voices of all people in this state and believes that all communities should be empowered by our electoral process, he will sign this bill as is. That is why we are all, as a coalition, calling on Governor Rauner to fulfill his moral obligation as the leader of this great state and sign House Bill 4469 into law as is and let all people vote. How do I put a dent in this massive system? And one of the first rules of organizing is you center the people most impacted. And with that, we were you know, really great at doing voter registration on college campuses and in bars and all of that, but we had never done it inside Cook County Jail or any jail for that matter. Um, and so the whole idea was really building political power inside the jail to start holding judges accountable, to start holding the state's attorney accountable. In 2016, Anita Alvarez was running against Kim Fox. Anita Alvarez is a notorious prosecutor um, who has done some horrendous things, and we were able to vote her out. So we could show how much power there really is from organizing people who are truly impacted by our American legal system. Because the intention around this work was never on the onset to be a legislative fight. Uh, when I first joined Chicago Votes in June 2017, it was just me and two other people on staff. We were approached with an opportunity to register people to vote inside the Cook County Jail. And we didn't really know what this would look like, but we went and had a meeting with the sheriff, uh, Tom Dart, and we asked him, like, can we start running a consistent program where we're bringing volunteers into the jail to register people to vote? And he said, I am comfortable with facilitating any sort of positive interaction between community members and those who are locked up. So naturally, being an organizer, I started asking for more things. Um, 
I asked if we could start running elections in the jail. And he was like, sure. And I asked if we could start doing civic education in the jail. And he was like, sure. After that meeting, um, we were like, damn, this is about to be popping. So the next month, we took a small team into the jail and we did voter registration for the first time. So then the question became, well, how are we going to vote? I was like, good question. Um, we left the jail and me and Jen set up a meeting with uh, Lance Goff, the executive director of the Chicago Board of Elections. And we were just like, look, we've been doing voter registration in the jail. We want to get polling locations in the jail so that people can actually vote in these elections and we're not just registering people to vote for no reason. And his lawyers were there. And they were like, no, like that's not happening. You can't turn, you can't put a polling location inside a jail without allowing everybody in the community to have access to that polling location. What you can do is establish a temporary polling location that is reserved for people inside jail to vote at. And in order for that to be established, you have to pass a law that will change the statute to allow people in jail to have access to actual voting machines. We established more deeper relationships with people who were working in the carceral system over the course of that time. And one of those people was Dr. Christina Rivers. She was actually in the very first meeting that the ACLU ever hosted about putting together a piece of legislation. That's when I met her. And she was talking about this work she was doing in Stateville, how she's running a think tank, how she's doing these surveys and people are learning about like what it means to be civically engaged. And so we joined and started participating in that and ended up writing a second piece of legislation called Civics in Prison, which will require that people are taught civics as part of their reentry process. So in 2019, we passed those two bills and that laid the framework for where we're at now, which is trying to ensure that people who are currently incarcerated in prisons with felony also have eligibility to vote. One of the things that the jail really does appreciate about us going in there is every interaction we have with people detained is a positive interaction. It's an empowering interaction. And oftentimes when they have visitors, it's a sad conversation. It's not always the best of news, especially when people are coming from environments filled with trauma. Um, it's, it's difficult. And so I think that it just served as a, almost a light and some hope in the jail. And I know a lot of people talked about restoring their dignity, being able to have their voice while voting in the jail. Um, you know, it's not a solve all problem, but at the same time, the security guard or the COs are looking at them different when they both have the equal amount of pow political power for the most part. Um, so I think that it's expanded in the fact that we've had over 5,000 people register to vote with us in the jail over the years, um, and we're well known. So when we go in there, like people know who we are, and we know they know that we are there to provide an opportunity for them to get involved. Um, and it's not a handout; it's just here, like, this is an opportunity, let's do it together. The impact of turning the jail into a polling location was extremely poignant in that before it was a polling location, less than 10% of the people incarcerated at the Cook County Jail voted. After the first year of it being a polling location, that number skyrocketed to 40%. So what's clear that people want to engage and that providing meaningful access is extremely important for someone's willingness and ability to actually participate in the democratic process. And for the first time ever, ballots will be cast at the Cook County Jail tomorrow. Voting for pre-trial detainees was conducted through a mail-in ballot system, but starting tomorrow, the jail will be its own polling precinct allowing some detainees to vote in the Illinois March primary. around voting in jails and a person's right, rights after release suppressed the votes of thousands of people, predominantly black and brown. And in, in Illinois, we are saying no more. Now, 
Detainees at this facility will have the opportunity to vote in the general election. They will help determine who holds office, who sits on the bench, and what policies and laws will govern, govern our daily lives. This powerful occasion is the result of legislation signed by Governor Pritzker more than a year and a half ago. In the work that I get the chance to do in places like jails and prisons, I've heard from community members again and again that they're interested in having a positive impact on their community, that they're interested in having a say in who represents them and who represents all of us. And there is a movement. There are a lot of community members who, who one may not guess this, but who are really um, having very valuable insights into how to change our policies and our government for the better. I don't think this is something new. The sooner that we're open to hearing those insights from incarcerated community members, the better that our government systems can be. The people who was closest to the problem know the solution. So I feel like in order to actually make change, we have to reach out to the bottom, if you will. We have to reach out to those who are directly impacted, you know, and I think that um, the voice has to be heard. If and when incarcerated peoples have the chance to vote, it will improve democracy because all of their experiences shared and different will breathe new life in something that is dead and rotten. I'm gonna do everything to ensure that I excel way beyond your perception of what a convicted person should be able to do. Because I'm so much more than that. I'm not defined by corrections, I'm defined by me. But they attempt to do that with their policies and laws to define you, murderer, robber. No, I committed this act, that's not who I am. Now I'm responsible for being so much more than that. Yeah. I just was released April of last year um, and I was incarcerated from the age of 14. Um, the person I am today is a product of, of prison, unfortunately. And, and But um, I learned a lot about myself. I, I, I became a spiritual leader. I became an academic leader. I became um, a, a great person, if you ask me, and those people around me. But um, and so I displayed these um, these characters like everybody else, you know. And so if we put these individuals on the forefront, it would allow people to see them as people. And then once once the narrative is changed, and I believe legislation will change to all uh, grassroots movements, to all. Uh, people who who trying to make change in whatever aspect when it comes to the, this justice system or legal system because nothing is just about it uh, involve those directly impacted uh, for the simple fact that people who are closest to the problem is closest to the solution um, simple fact that we had to sit on these this pain um, sit on these feelings for years um, it births certain angles that someone outside will never be able to uh, to imagine. An individual like me had went through so much and felt certain things that I didn't even know what I was feeling. So I can't even explain it, let alone you or someone outside um, who, who never been um, directly impacted. So involve those directly impacted individuals, um, you'll be surprised at what, what actually can happen.
Heard this and told bro my soul said go ahead Talk about that old man you got from that old man When you were 17 sitting in Menard And them bars was starting to heart in your heart So you wrote hard to soften your scars And how that man life was lost on the yard And how him being 39 was like a car from a law Light in the dark cause I'd be 39 Had I did that time 25 at 100 Sell something like a dungeon Smell just like a basement Some say it was hunted by crownless kings Died with a team of mouths to feed That only means that that hunger never dies Now I'm left in the dark Feeling like the sun will never rise Left at a star With forever hunger in their eyes Today in the cell Chewing on food from thought From a God Come on man Been there I uh, was there, 13 years there, made bread out of crumbs there. Learn if you don't tell it, it'll never be told. And if I don't sell it, it'll never be sold. Even if I gotta yell it, shit, I better be bold, cause they don't open up the door. I'm doing what I'm doing out of habit. I don't never pop a zany, I don't even think about it, but I roll a lot. And I don't have it all together, but the flow is hot. I hit a mic to get some water by the bottle, cause I know it probably happen if I talk a lot. I'm in a room with all my demons and the door is locked I thought I lost them, put them all the way up in the attic Depression still ain't got enough of me, she been an addict I've been too busy running game up in Newport Yeah, I chain, but I never hit a Newport Never bang, but I stay around a few forks A few chain, got me moving like a new sport I'm Luke Kane with the kick, I got a few parts Hope this shit gon' bang, in a whip, I need a new start Now I'm on fire like I ain't black enough Stressed out, got on roll like I don't act enough, so this is how I'm living and I'm doing it wrong. Pray for me, you know that I be living alone. Thankfully, I got the title running right behind me. Right on the island, if you don't know where to find me. Higher than I ever been, you see me in the climbing. Ay. I see the future and it's all in perfect timing. I, I see the mountain, but I don't know how to climb it. I've been rhyming like I'm throwing up the diamond. I've been focused on it so. I get back to business, I've been focused on the go. So if I'm moving different, know that I've been working on it. I'ma hit you back, I told you I've been working on it. Working on forgiveness, busy working, I'ma miss it. Move from shot to Nola, home again, I missed a mission. That ain't never helping no one but my fucking self. I keep thinking that it's over, but I know myself. Think I know I need some help, so tell me what you got to say. Baby, I'm on my way. You don't even have to stay. Just give me one more time. Thank you.